Well, it's a joy to be here and look into your bleary eyes and tired faces and uh, see you all still trying to hang in there at 8,000 feet. I, uh, I tend to get suits disease just running up and down the steps. You know what suits disease is, don't you? That's where your, your tongue has a coat on it and your breath comes out in long pants. And uh, <laughs> I bring you greetings from uh, Keith and Suzanne Pierce, who called me specially to tell me to convey their love and wishes to you. They're up in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and kind of lonesome up there. Anytime you want uh, to meet some ex-Mormons for Jesus up there, why uh, drop up to Hal Halifax, Nova Scotia. I was up there about two years ago, and he was district mission president at the time and just ready for somebody to give him a little shove to come out. And uh, finally uh, began attending a Baptist church, and I kept calling him about every month and spending 14 and $15 for phone bills. And about the third time I called, he says, well, my wife and I have both been born again. We've joined the Baptist church up here, and we're beginning to lead Mormons to the Lord. Uh, he's kind of got a dry humor. Uh, he told me on the phone that he was talking to one Mormon who was so insistent about everybody being children of God in a pre-existence. And he said, well, I read in my Bible that uh, some, ch some people are bastards. He said, I don't know what that says about God's wife. And then he said, and I read in another place that uh, Jesus talked about some people as the children of the devil, and uh, that must mean the devil has a wife. And, uh, and then he said, also, I read over here about being children by adoption in Christ Jesus. And the fellow Mormon said, well, that sounds like the best option to me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I thought that was kind of a cute little thing. I thought that this afternoon I would talk to you about a, a kind of a assortment of things and uh, try to finish early enough uh, in what I want to share with you so that you have some chance to ask questions not necessarily I want to talk about because some of you know that I've done some stuff on the early revival and the 1820 uh, vision story and uh, also uh, was fortunate enough as, uh, by God's grace to uh, stumble upon a, a, the 1826 court trial bill and people at the tables will sometimes ask me one thing or another about that, so I don't want to say that our questions have to be limited in any sense to what I talk about, but since we're kind of considering witnessing, I thought I'd share a few thoughts with you, which I call background for witnessing. I really don't get much chance to witness the Mormons. I keep signing up at all the information centers and no Mormon will come and see me. And we don't have any Mormons in the area, so I hardly ever get to talk to Mormons. So I'm not an expert at witnessing the Mormons, but I did the next best thing. Uh, if you're not an expert, you go survey all the people that are experts. And so a couple years ago, um, I contacted and uh, grabbed everything I could find on how you witness the Mormons and uh, called Mullane Layton and uh, uh, called uh, Iyer Ransom and uh, called all around the country and read John L. Smith's book and took notes. And I concluded that there are three basic ways of witnessing to Mormons with an infinite variety under each of them. But uh, they boil down to this. You can either use the Bible and witness to Mormons, as I Ransom does, a number of, other, of you have been effectively doing, or you can use the Book of Mormon to witness to Mormons. That is mainly, this is where your main thrust is. Nobody uses any one of these methods in isolation or exclusion of, uh, from the others, uh, like John L. Smith does. Or you can uh, hit him in the head uh, with the conflicts and get their attention that way, uh, like the material from the Tanners has done. Now, you can't put the last method down because I asked Malene when they first uh, got uh, ex-Mormons uh, for Jesus going, I said, uh, they used to write, I don't know whether they still do this or not, they had everybody that, that came and, and uh, uh, said, I want to be an ex-Mormon for Jesus, write a little summary of their own testimony and tell how they came, what brought them out of Mormonism to the Lord. And I think at the time I asked Malene, there were 400 people that she, whose name she had, and she said half of them were brought out of Mormonism and to the Lord because of the conflicts and contradictions. That's 50%. That's a pretty good batting average. So these, I think, are the three basic methods, and it's nice to keep them in your mind in a somewhat separation so that you can do this sort of thing. If plan A fails, try plan B. If plan C fails, try plan B. Uh, you apply B fails, try plan C. 
And most of us do this sort of thing, only we kind of do it on a hop, skip, and jump basis. It might be better if we concentrated on one aspect that we felt most comfortable with and then brought the others in as uh, we felt the support needed for them. Remember, David couldn't fight in uh, Saul's armor, and some of us can't fight in another man's apologetic uh, or uh, myth witnessing method. We have to do what we feel most comfortable with. So under the Bible, if we approach it that way, there are certain uh, things that we have to take into account. And the first is that the terms that the Mormons use, although they're lifted from the Bible, are all given new meanings. Now, you all know that. Uh, if you read Bob Whitty's, uh, where does it say that? If you read the Tanner's little uh, sheet where they have definition after definition, where Godhead doesn't mean Godhead as we under Christians understand it. It means three separate uh, beings, who, two of whom had flesh and bone bodies. Um, um, atonement and redemption uh, mean canceling out Adam's sin and giving everyone another resurrection. Being born again means being baptized by water in the Mormon church and so on. So when you use Bible terms, uh, well, the Bible is saying one thing and you're meaning that same thing, the Mormon is getting an entirely different message. And therefore, you're going to have to beware of simply presenting a passage to them and expecting that they're going to understand what you're saying. Sometimes you have to paraphrase it yourself and put it into words. And uh, you might have to say, instead of grace, you might have to say favor that we didn't deserve or kindness showed to us by God that when we really didn't uh, uh, deserve such kindness. And so after you use the term, then you've got to put some content back into it. But even getting over that hurdle, uh, if you've ever dealt with a Mormon from the Bible, you find that sooner or later, whenever you get stuck, the dependability of the Bible comes at, to issue. You know, well, the Bible's had so many changes. Uh, uh, we're not sure the plain and precious parts were taken out. And um, I know our Ransom told me that he wrestled with that for a long, long time, trying to figure a way around it. He wind up with a two-hour argument on trying to prove to the Mormon the Bible was reliable. And finally, it came down to this simple thing. He said, why not just put it right up front? And... Um, Ask the Mormon, how reliable do you feel the Bible is? And then they were for forced to give the usual quotation, you know, insofar as it's correctly translated. Now, they don't really mean correctly translated. They mean correctly transmitted is what they really mean by that phrase. Because I wouldn't believe the Bible where it's incorrectly translated, would you? No, absolutely not. So that statement is a good statement, but they don't mean what the words say. And, and so, uh, whenever they quote that, Ira would say to them, uh, well, can you show me where it's not correctly translated, and I'll avoid uh, using those passages. And then usually you would get a conversation like, uh, duh, well, um, er, um, mm, well, um, let's see, uh, I, I guess I can't think of one off the top of my head. So then you just press forward and say, well, is it alright to use the whole Bible then? And he might get a brain start saying, oh, uh, it's all right except where Joseph Smith corrected it, his inspired version. And I said, okay, I'll buy that. Wherever Joseph uh, differed with it, well, we'll just set those passages aside and we'll just use what's left. And, uh, you know, the inspired version has an interesting passage in Romans 3 where it says uh, uh, that we are, uh, man is not justified by the works of the law, but he's justified by faith. And the inspired version added alone which is interesting it's interesting <laughs> alone <laughs> that's in Romans whether it's 328 or somewhere around in there and um, uh, in inspired version and uh, that socks him between the eyes sometimes so uh, you you need to be willing to put the Mormon on the spot and get a commitment from him now, occasionally you will get uh, Mormon people who have been so battered by the idea that the Bible is undependable that, in honesty, you do have to deal with this matter, but not necessarily in a combative sense like you would be uh, in an argument, but the person is really has been taught that the Bible is unreliable. So I wanted to say just a few things about the Bible's dependability and its completeness because, you know, you get this charge that plain and precious parts are taken, about, taken out. Uh, first of all, uh, with regard to the New Testament text, 
I think that all of us in the room know that we are at a state of the art, if we could put it that way, in the biblical text, that um, we have done a remarkable job of reconstructing the original text. But there are still some places where there are variant readings and we don't know which reading is correct. And that fact sometimes leaves the layman to uh, pick up his uh, Bible and to say, gee whiz, I don't know whether the first three words of this, uh, this fifth verse are true and, and part of what God really said, or whether the next three words were wrong. And you get the impression that someplace in this book there's a lot of wrong words and you don't know where they are. That's not the situation at all. The situation is this, that practically every pastor and Bible scholar has a critical edition, say, of the Greek New Testament. And a critical edition has what they call a critical apparatus at the bottom. What scholars have done, they have poured over the some thousands of Greek New Testament manuscripts and compared all the variants in all of these thousands of manuscripts. And they find that they kind of followed the families. If they have a, this reading here, why right down the line a little further, they'll have this, uh, another reading. And all these manuscripts tend to fall into patterns, which makes this problem a little simpler because then you get groups of manuscripts that support one reading as over against another. And uh, the result is that they can reduce the options to the leading and most uh, influential manuscripts and take all the late ones and because they're all just following along in the trail of the earlier ones where they have these differences. And they can set it up in a system of, uh, of code numbers at the bottom that are keyed to the front of the book. And you can tell exactly what manuscripts read one way, and they'll give you the phrase where the, where the phrase is. And then where a phrase differs, they'll give you the manuscript that reads the other way. Now, let me give you a practical example. In John, the first chapter, we have in the 13th verse the great statement about as many as received him, to them he gave the right or exousia authority to become the children of God. The text as it stands, starts off with the Greek word uh, equivalent of who, or which, it says in King James, which were born, in verse 13, not of the will of man or the will of uh, flesh, but of God. And it talks about the new birth, right? Now, the which, or the who, is plural. And in Greek, that's the letter O, and uh, beside it is the letter I. All right, O-I, hoi. It's a rough breathing, so it sounds like it's H-O-I. Now, some manuscripts don't read hoi, they read has. And in the early manuscripts, they wrote all in capital letters. And an S in a capital letter in Greek looks like a C. So you got O-C, which is really S. Now, if you're writing and you write O-I carelessly and your I bends, <laughs> what do you got? Yeah. Or if you're writing OS and you, you don't curve it enough, it looks like an I. All right? So you can see how the mistake could be easily made. Now, some manuscripts, therefore, read Haas, and Haas is singular. And if the text read, who was born not of the will of man or the will of the flesh, but of God, what would that refer to? Hmm? Jesus and his virgin birth. Right? Now, it would be nice to settle the question one way or the other, wouldn't it? <laughs> well, the majority of manuscripts read plural, and so it does seem to be correct to understand it as a reference to our new birth in Christ. But someday we might find a very, very, very old manuscript, and it might really read Haas because there's some evidence that some manuscripts read Haas, <laughs> and it error could have been the other way. Now, no theology is damaged either way with the reading. But what I want to point out is we know exactly where the problem is and there's no problem with the rest of the words in the rest of the verse. So it's not as though we got a book and anywhere in here there might be words that are wrong or mistaken or copy errors. We know what 99 and 99 one hundred percent of the text as it originally was given really is. Because the, the professionals who have made an intense study of just this area of textual criticism 
tell us that only about one word in a thousand is in any question in the entire New Testament. Now that's one hundredth of a percent if my figures are right. That's very, very minimal. And this is an astounding amount of accuracy. I doubt that uh, a lot of books that are put out in the press today uh, are put out with, with uh, any less typographical errors in them. <laughs> so as far as the text of the New Testament is concerned, we are in very, very good shape, and we know exactly what words are in question, and those will not alter any major doctrine of the New Testament. Secondly, as regards the Old Testament text, we don't have as many manuscripts, but the Dead Sea Scrolls have helped us out tremendously with this. But again, there's a criticalization of the Old Testament text that's been put out, the latest one by Stuttgart edition, um, includes all the stuff from the Dead Sea Scrolls. And it used to be that when we considered the Greek translation of the Old Testament made about 200 B.C., made from Hebrew into Greek for the Greek-speaking Jews in the, in the Roman and Greek world, uh, that text was considered now well, maybe uh, different from the Hebrew text that's been delivered to us down through the centuries at spots, and so somebody thought, well, that's unreliable. And when you considered that a number of the quotations in the New Testament are made from that text, then you think, well, you know, uh, uh, what, what do we do about that? That maybe the New Testament is depending on a text that's not a real good text, and maybe its point evaporates out the window. For example, in the first chapter of Hebrews, it says, let all the angels of God worship him. And that's in the Greek Septuagint in the 32nd chapter of Deuteronomy, but it shows up nowhere in our Hebrew text that has come down through the centuries. But guess what happened at the Dead Sea Scrolls? It showed up in the text of Deuteronomy <laughs> that was preserved from the Dead Sea Scrolls. So uh, scholars have said, uh, well, look at this, will you? The Septuagint is much more dependable than we ever thought it was. And so we are in a much better position now to determine what the original Hebrew text was, since the Dead Sea Scrolls have given us much more confidence in the use of the Septuagint, which the New Testament depends so heavily upon. And um, something else interesting fell out of this whole discussion of the Dead Sea Scroll material. They found that the text that's come down to us through the Jews, which is the one that the King James Version was translated from and so on, uh, has had an unusual thing happen to it. It's, it, it growed, as the guy says, <laughs> in size. Uh, the Jews wanted to be sure that everybody got the meaning. So say, for example, in the uh, building of the tabernacle. Do you ever feel like you read the same thing just in a paragraph before? You shall make an ark, you know. It shall be so many cubits, but so many cubits, so many cubits. You overlay it with gold. And um, you shall make rings on the side. And it says, and so they made the ark. So many cubits, but so many cubits, so many cubits. Overlay it with gold. And it has rings on the sides. And I just read that up there three verses earlier. Well, oddly enough, some of these texts of the Dead Sea Scrolls are shorter, and they're shorter in that they don't have the repetition. And so uh, Dr. Uh, Frank Crossan, whom I studied Hebrew, uh, in his book, The Ancient Library of Qum Qumran, points this out and says what's happened is that the Jewish copyists wanted to make so sure that, that you knew what it referred to, and so they made it, <laughs> that they simply repeated what was said above, so instead of plain and precious parts falling out, plain and precious parts fell in. <laughs> <laughs> now, also, in the Book of Mormon concept that plain and precious parts have been taken away, um, when you stop to think about the, the way the early uh, biblical manuscripts were copied, it, it becomes very ridiculous to think that the statement of the Book of Mormon could in any sense of the word be true. Now, if I run a book publishing company and uh, I control all the bound volumes of the books that go out and I suddenly decide before they're shipped out that I'm going to cut out 15 pages and rebind them all, well, I can cut out plain and precious parts from some book. But if, uh, suppose I took a pillow with feathers and uh, I went down the road at 60 miles an hour and I kept shaking the pillow out the window until all the feathers were gone and I got to my house and my wife says, you got rid of all those feathers, go back down that road, I pick every one of those up. 
Now, what would be the probability of my getting every one of those feathers after they've all gone all over the place? <laughs> no. And that's somewhat similar to what happened with the New Testament manuscripts. Uh, nobody had a central headquarters controlling the copying of the New Testament books. Paul wrote a letter to the Ephesians. The people at Philippi wanted it. They said, hey, we got a letter from Paul. We'll trade you. And so uh, uh, just like with uh, somebody gets a, a document out of the archives, they said, can I get a copy of that? Yeah. And the next thing you know, it's all over the place. I did an interview uh, with uh, uh, Legrand Richards, and uh, I, I did an unwise thing. I had my tape recorder running but didn't tell him. And I was going to just have it for my own purpose that I made sure that I didn't misunderstand anything he said. But on the, on the tape, at the, as we ended the conversation, he said, and if you tell people this, you'll be telling them the truth. I said, oh, can I quote you on this? And he said, yes, and that's all on tape. So uh, two young men from Brigham Young University uh, were at my friend's house when I got back from the interview, and uh, they were working on this whole question of the, um, what, what's the nature of this revelation. And they wanted to hear this tape, so I played it for them, and uh, oh, they had to have a copy. So I thought, well, you know, it's their own apostle. He says it's all right to quote him on it, so I let him make a copy. Next thing I know, uh, they, have, uh, they have reproduced a transcript, and it's all over the place, and Bob Whitty wanted a copy. So he produced it. Went, well, anyway, the next thing I heard, it was on the air in Salt Lake City. <laughs> so I called uh, LeGrand Richards. I said, I have an apology to make to you. I, I think I have done you a great disservice. And I wrote him a letter of apology. I said, you can publish it in the Desert News. I said, I really was a dumb, stupid thing to do to let this out. And, uh, of course, he thought it was a dirty trick that I didn't let him know I was recording. And I agreed with him that it was very, very uh, unwise that I did that. Um, but you can see how things proliferate. And there was no way I could go back and pick up every one of those copies. And I couldn't pick up even the tapes that were made from that thing and take out any plain and precious parts if I had. I wouldn't like Nixon, you know, where you could take 18 minutes out and, and there's only one copy. <laughs> so the idea that anybody could take out plain and precious parts and uh, not have them show up in some ancient manuscript. We've got manuscripts of the New Testament that go back to about 200 A.D. And their text reads exactly the same as the text that the King James Version was translated from. No plain and precious parts are missing or added. So the whole concept of plain and precious parts being taken out, the only way you could have that happen would be have the apostles write all the New Testament letters, and before they were mailed out, take plain and precious parts out themselves. Because the New Testament text is represented in its present format at such an early date that you'd have to have the apostles or their co-laborers be the conspirators to take it out, and then it wouldn't be certain with some corrupt church in the 3rd century or 4th century. Secondly... Uh, the Mormons sometimes talk about the completeness of the Bible and suggest that not everything is in the Bible that should be in the Bible, and how do you know that the Bible is complete? And I must admit that at this point, most Christians have a problem. We don't have a problem getting Revelation started. We have a problem getting it stopped. <laughs> and so sometimes they'll quote the passage at the end of the uh, book of uh, Revelation where uh, anybody that... that uh, and adds to the book, the curses of the book will be added to him, and any man takes away from the book, uh, well, the, the, his part of the book of life will be taken away. That refers only to the book of Revelation. If you use that text, the same thing is said in the book of Deuteronomy, and there'd be no Bible beyond the book of Deuteronomy. Now, there is, uh, I think, within the Bible itself, a testimony of its own completeness. Everybody grants the Old Testament looking for further revelation. They're looking for the Messiah to come. And the Gospel records announce, hey, he's here. Now, we don't know that the New Testament books were, are in the Bible in the order in which they were written. They probably are not. But there's a certain logical order that they have fallen into. And I don't know that any one man has managed to put them in this order. They just sort of, it just sort of happened. And uh, with the Lord's guidance, of course. And Matthew, being the most Jewish, is really the logical book to stand connected with the Old Testament. And then you get Mark, which is addressed to the Roman mind. Then you get Luke, which is addressed to the whole cosmopolitan Greek and Roman world. And then you get John, which is dealing with the Son of God as, as God himself incarnate. It's a theological concept. 
And yet there's very little interpretation in the Gospels. The Gospels concentrate on saying the fact is that this is the Messiah. He's here. Oh, you get a rare occasion when it, Jesus said, I give my life a ransom for many, you know. But very little interpretive material. It just describes his death for the most part. But, you know, a fact without an interpretation is really meaningless, isn't it? Yeah. You could look at the death of Christ, and if you had no interpretive material, just think of all the variations you could get. Eh, it just shows good guys always get done in, you know. That's one interpretation, isn't it? Um, well, that should show us that we can't really go up against the politicians of the day, see. Or, um, well, when anybody tries to start something new and sticks his neck out, he deserves to get it cut off. <laughs> you can give any interpretation you want. And so you've got to have not only the divine fact, you need the divine interpretation. And all the Gospels essentially give us is the man. And the book of Acts gives us the movement. And we begin to see what Christ's coming means for the Gentile world, that he is their salvation. And we find out how to be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And we begin to see that his death on the cross was the means of ridding us of sin. He sent us to bless us, Peter said, in turning every one of us away from our sins. And without the next section, the book of Acts, if you suddenly had the letters of Paul next, you say, well, who's this character? I never heard him before. You know, Peter, I read about Peter and James and John, but who, Paul, who's he? So the book of Acts sets the stage for the epistles. And the epistles give us the meaning of Christ for our Christian lives. And finally, the book of Revelation is fittingly caps it off, although it may have been written earlier than some of the other New Testament books. And it gives us the final manifestation. Now, what's so interesting is that Jesus himself looked for further revelation to be given. Remember in John chapters 14 and following, uh, he preaches his own funeral sermon in effect and uh, says, this is what I want to tell you, I'm going away, so on, and I've got many things to tell you, but you're not ready for them yet. Well, my word, he's going to be dead the next day. When's he going to tell them? Well, he said, when the Spirit comes, well, he's going to guide you to all the truth. So the gospel records end looking for further revelation. And the book of Acts is very clear. The Spirit is guiding them, speaking to the apostles, letting them know they did the right thing. Remember, Jesus had said to Peter uh, and to the apostles, those who sit in Moses' seat, you obey them. He had also said to his apostles, go out to all the world and preach the gospel. Or 3.14, continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing of whom you have learned them, and that from the child you have known the Holy Scriptures. And then he goes on and says, you know, all Scriptures God breathed and is profitable for doctrine. So you got it all there. That's everything you need. Um, 4.2, preach the word. Jude 3, earnestly contend for the faith. Hapax, once. And um, it, once in Greek usually means once and only once, and in a sense of once for all. Um, when a word occurs only one time in the Bible, and we can't find any other examples in ancient Greek literature of it, doesn't mean it wasn't used, but there's none survived to us. We call that a hapax legomena, a once word. And it occurred only once, and that's it. And so Jude says you can turn earnest, contend earnestly for the faith once, and so we throw in once for all, delivered to the saints. You've got it all right there. And so in that sense, it's very fitting that although the words about adding to and taking from occur at the end of the book of Revelation and refer exclusively to that book, there is a kind of a sense in which it's fitting to end that way and remind everybody, hey, you don't have to look for something else. Now, we do really look for further revelation. Uh, one great big revelatory event that's still coming, and what is that? The second coming of Christ, right. So the New Testament does look for further revelation, but not until the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I think within the book itself, there is this self-contained um, witness to its own completeness. Now, if you want to explore this further, I suggest you get Bernard's Progress of Doctrine in the New Testament. Um, I think it's available on microfiche. It's out of print, but I think uh, the American Mission to Greeks uh, has it for sale for a couple of bucks on microfiche. And if you've got a microfiche library in your local library, you can grab it. And I think you'll be thrilled to see this theme that I've just sketched for you laid out in full there. And to me, it was one of the most satisfying presentations of that uh, in the, um, the whole time I was in seminary. Uh, getting on with um, Ira Ransom's uh, second 
uh, big hurdle. The first was getting over the Bible, and we just kind of gave you a little background for witnessing something you might want to have in your mind uh, as a posture of mental attitude as you come at the uh, Mormon. The second thing is uh, you always get into this problem of, I want to testify that I know the Book of is true, the prophet is true, church is true, whatever, right? Just when you got down to the text of the Bible and you think you got the thing nailed down, uh, they flip into this uh, auto automaton type of, of uh, testimony. And that bothered Irans for a long time. And finally, he thought, why don't I put that right up front, too? So instead of, in addition to asking, you know, you tell me how reliable you think the Bible is, and we'll go from there. The second question he asked is, uh, in your search for truth, which do you think is more reliable, feelings or the Bible? And he gets a commitment right at the front. And he tries to show them that feelings can be distorted. I was raised in Baltimore, which is uh, practically a southern town, and my father, and my apology to any blacks in the room here, my father used to say this to me, a nigger's a nigger, and he'll be a nigger till he dies. And I was raised with that idea, and for years I couldn't even shake hands with a black man because I felt he was dirty. But Christ delivered me for that. I can come up and hug a black man as a brother of Christ now. But um, feelings, you see, that are built in wrong from the beginning are disastrous. That's a terrible thing. And the Bible says there is a way that seems right unto a man, the ends thereof are the ways of death. Feelings are terrible. But Jesus said, my word, heaven and earth pass away, but my word will never pass away. And so uh, you want to get right up front the matter of feeling. And I think that the basic testimony is nothing more than feeling. And the bottom line in Mormonism is not evidence, it's not archaeology, it's not geography, it's not history, it is feeling. The thing you know, the reason you know Mormonism is true is because you have a feeling. And I think Christians have a hard time, because we have feelings too, we feel that we're true, this is right, we have a hard time seeing that there's a big difference between Mormon feeling and Christian feeling. And I try to diagram it this way. Uh, you can elaborate on this and even borrow it if you want. That's not copyrighted. But as I see it, what happens with the Holy Spirit is that the Holy Spirit comes and uses the Word. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word. Say, okay, so but it's the Holy Spirit that takes the Word and makes it work in the person and produces an experience. And what's Romans say about that experience? Romans 8, 16, the Spirit witnesses soon marteo, together with our spirits. So we feel, what? That we are children of God, right. And uh, because we are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son so that we cry, what? Abba, Father, Daddy, you know. Okay, what's happening with the witness of the Spirit? It is witnessing that our experience is real and genuine. Now, look what happens with the Mormon testimony. See, this doesn't, this doesn't witness that the book is true, right? It witnesses that our experience is true because it matches the book. But the Mormon has his coming down from, he thinks from the Holy Spirit. I put a serpent up there <laughs> in a balloon. <laughs> and it gives him the feeling that the book is true. Here, the book gives the feeling that his experience is true. Here, the Mormon feeling witnesses the book is true. And even if, the, if you find and prove the book is false, he still thinks it's true. See? And I think there's a tremendous difference between what happens in reality when the Holy Spirit witnesses to a Christian than whatever spirit there is witnesses to a Mormon. They both got feelings involved mind you, but the whole process is just the reverse of each other. So I think that what happens is that in the Christian, the Holy Spirit validates the experience as genuine. In the Mormon, that spirit validates the LDS as genuine. Uh, in a Christian, the truth determines your feelings. In Mormonism, Feelings determine the truth. And so you're at other opposite extremes. So much for that. Let me move on to the second method of witnessing to Mormons, which is using the Book of Mormon. And I have here, which uh, you're willing to 
I'm willing to let you take upstairs and copy on the largest copy machine if you want a copy. Um, some that passages from the Book of Mormon, and the Utah edition has a U in front of it with a page number followed by the verse, and the reorganized edition has uh, an R in front of it with the page number and the verse. And what this does, this, this was gotten together by Olive and Jean Wilcox, who before they gave up the Book of Mormon, believed the Book of Mormon was true because they found the gospel in the Book of Mormon. And they used to go around Independence, Missouri, to everybody, all of the organized Mormons, and tell them the whole gospel simply using the Book of Mormon. I said to Jean one day, and Olive, I said, hey, sit down and write out all the verses they used to use to prove the Book of Mormon was true. And so they did, and they put them under categories, and all I did was type it up and found the corresponding place in the Utah edition, so that they wouldn't have to go nuts trying to find their page references. But you can show from the Book of Mormon, God is a spirit, that there's only one God, God is unchangeable, man's nature is sinful, you need a spiritual birth, there's no salvation after death, there's only two destinies, two places you can go to, heaven or hell, that torment is eternal, that salvation is by Christ's work and not man's work, that baptism is not essential for salvation, that even the Bible contains the truth, and that only one priesthood exists after Christ. And all that you can find a book, and these are the references with little, quote, little quotes, uh, the leading uh, phrase from each of those quotations, that if you want to take and copy it, you're welcome. Uh, Two things out and put it out as one of our tracks called Divine Truths of the Book of Mormon. They're all gone, but I had a hundred of them up there, so and maybe you can find some use for it. Um, the, uh, uh, the Book of Mormon definitely contains a monotheistic view of God. In fact, I'm convinced that the view of God in the Book of Mormon is Sabellianism, and Sabellianism was popular in Ontario County. There's a booklet written uh, by um, David Millard, who lived 25 miles from Joseph Smith and was published in Canandaigua, which was only 13 miles from Joseph Smith, and it's called The True Messiah Revealed. Now, he had a kind of a weird idea about God. He thought that, uh, that uh, God actually had a hunk of himself come off or something, his own substance, and uh, that the Son was uh, begotten just like um, um, you, uh, my Son would be actually my flesh, see, but separate from me. And he had to face all these preachers in the area that were saying, hey, then you wind up with two gods, and how are you going to worship two gods? And his answer was, well, if the Father told us to worship the Son, then it's okay. So it's an interesting little track. But in there, he mentions that Sabellianism was popular in that area. And this track was written in, booklet was written in 1818 and enlarged into a book in 1823. Now, Sabellianism says that God is so much one that there really isn't any distinction between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That it's just a way of our talking about God. Now see, in true Trinitarianism, you could take everybody in this room away and the whole world away and God would still be Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But in Sabellianism, you take, God is only a Trinity because we think of him that way. See, as long as we exist, he'll be a Trinity. So when we think of him upstairs in heaven, we call him the Father. When we think of him about coming in our midst, we call him the Son. When we think about him working inside of us, we call him the Holy Spirit. Now, you take Mosiah, 15. He is, in virtue uh, of the Spirit, he's the Father. In virtue of the flesh, he's the Son. Being one God, being the Father and the Son, see? And that's why Jesus Christ, in the Book of Mormon, can say, I am the Father and the Son. He's exactly one and the same, and it's just whether you're thinking about him in heaven or on earth that you call him either the Father or the Son. There's no real distinction within the nature of God. I was going to go on and talk a little bit about Trinity, but I don't want to use all our time up here on that, so maybe we can skip that over and go on to the third one, which is um, using conflicts. And I think basically what that does is to undermine authority. And in practically every cult group has an authority figure. And in one sense of the word, Christianity is a cult. Wow, isn't it? And we built around one central authority figure, Jesus Christ. So you can see, for the Jews of Jesus' day, they thought this sect is everywhere spoken against, see? The only difference between the cult of Christianity and any other cult <laughs> is that all other cult leaders can't make good on their claims. <laughs> and no other cult leader fulfilled prophetic prophecies and clued right in with what was predicted in the Old Testament that the leader would be, the Messiah. So um, uh, we're not a cult in a bad sense of the word, but uh, Christianity does focus around one central authority, and you know Satan likes to make counterfeits. So all his counterfeits have 
one central authority, whether it's Reverend Hoon or Mayor Baker Eddy or uh, the uh, leader at the Watchtower, Russell, or her successor, uh, or the, the Prophet Joseph Smith or the Prophet Brigham Young and all of his successors, but you've got this authority figure at the center. And Christians are not used to thinking in terms of authority. And so when Mormons say, where did you get your authority? We, huh? <laughs> I always like saying, where would you get yours? You know? Because, you know, the Mormons don't know where their authority is. They talk about four standard works, right? That's their authority. Uh, what made them their authority? The church voted on it, but why would that be the authority? You know, why should this, there be four standard works? Uh, and, and even if you accept the four standard works, what about when the Book of Mormon says God is a spirit, and the Doctrine and Covenant says that God's got a flesh and blood and body as tangible as a man's, and he can't get in a man's heart, because that's an old myth and an old uh, fable, and after all, you try to shove a man in, who's got a flesh and bone body in my heart, that'd give me a heart attack. <laughs> so, what happens when one of the four standard works disagrees with the other? Which, then, is the authority? The latest one? Why should that be? See? And then on top of that, the fourth standard works mentions the fifth standard work, the inspired version, right? Well, they don't bother with that. <laughs> they take the first seven chapters or eight chapters in the uh, book of Moses, but that's all. Uh, then you've got another little problem. You've got a, a living prophet. <laughs> and uh, do you go with Joseph Fielding Smith, who said, anytime I say anything contrary to what, living, what the fourth standard works say, just go with the fourth standard works, or do you follow Ezra Taft Benson that says, oh, you just don't worry about anything except what the living prophet says? That was a cute speech of Benson's, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Prove point by point bit by bit that you should only listen to a living prophet, and he did it, did it by quoting all the words of dead prophets. <laughs> Absolutely. Did you ever notice that? I think there's only one living person that he quoted, and all the rest were dead prophets, to prove the point that you should never listen to a dead prophet, you only listen to a living prophet. <laughs> and even if you listen to a living prophet, you got this little statement of Joseph Smith, you know, the prophet is only a prophet when he's acting as a prophet, from his church history which is also in his diary. Well, who said the church history is authority? <laughs> it's not the four standard works. <laughs> but even if you accept it as authority, how do you know when a prophet is speaking as a prophet? Uh, Wayne uh, Crothers is his name, I believe it was, wrote a book recently uh, called Us at the Lord. Any of you have a copy of it? Huh? Uh, you're not very fortunate. You see what happened, he solved the problem simple solution was anytime he says let's say the Lord it's uh, speaking as a prophet and when he's not why uh, then it's not speaking as a prophet well that put all of David McKay and Joseph Fielding Smith and uh, Spencer Kimball and everybody else out in left field because they never said thus saith the Lord you should paint your barns this year thus saith the Lord you should lay up two years of you know they just said it without thus saith the Lord so when the general authorities heard that they got a hold of him and said burn those books <laughs> so only a few of them got out <laughs> a friend of mine has one so where is their authority? I don't think they know. Hey, they can't quite find where it is. And they're asking you, where'd you get your authority? When they don't even know where theirs is? They got so many places to look, they don't know which one to look at. I think the Christian's authority is in two basic places. First, of course, it's in the Word of God. John 10.35, for example, says that... Um, I've said you're God, you know that quotation, and the scriptures cannot be broken. What's that mean? Well, you can't go against what the scripture says. That's what it's to break it means to go against it. And so that, if you can't go against it, it's the authority. Or you look at Hebrews uh, 2, 2 to 4, and um, it, there it's talking about if the word spoken by angels was steadfast and every transgression received a just recompense reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great, so great salvation which at the first began to be spoken, not by angels, but by the Lord, say, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him, with God bearing them witness with signs and wonders, gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, you look at the biblical pattern of how God establishes a prophet and establishes his word. He validates the man, Right? Then you better listen to what he says. Deuteronomy 18, you know, how are you going to know when the prophets can get well? If he speaks a word in the name of the Lord and it doesn't come to pass, you don't have to worry about that guy. In fact, a little further up says you put him to death. That may have been the reason that Joseph Smith died. But anyway, 
uh, his word will not come to pass if he speaks the name of the Lord. Now, if he speaks the name of other gods, tries to dilute the message and get you off on a false god, then it might come to pass, but you don't pay attention to it. So you've got to have those two things, see? And so the Holy Spirit, through the miracles that the apostles did, validated the men, and through short-term prophecies. I always liked that one of Micaiah and uh, Ahab and Jehoshaphat. Remember that story? Where... Um, and Jehoshaphat said, I think I'll go up and visit my cousin up in uh, uh, Samaria and uh, we'll uh, have a little powwow. And we got up there, Ahab says, says, hey, I want to go out and fight against the Syrians, uh, which the Israelites are still doing, I guess. And uh, he said, uh, I need Ahab, uh, Jehoshaphat's help. So he says, hey, how about we go out to war against um, the Syrians? And Jehoshaphat says, well, I don't know, I want to consult the Lord first. Well... Ahab had 500, 400, 600, I don't know, prophets on his payroll. So no problem, I got lots of prophets. Give me some prophets. Come here. They all come in. He says, if I go out to war, if we go out to war, and Jehoshaphat goes with me, will we win? Oh, yes, you'll win. Absolutely, you'll win. Jehoshaphat said, don't you have a prophet of Yahweh here? He said, yeah, we have a guy named Micah, but he never has anything nice to say about me. <laughs> so, Je so Jehoshaphat says, why don't you bring him in? So they bring him in, and he says, Micaiah? He says, if we go out to war, will we win? And he says, sure, you'll win. And he says, get that guy out of here. And as he's about leaving, he turns around and says, if you go out to war and you come back at all in peace, then you'll know the Lord has not spoken by me. Now, he was kind of being uh, sarcastic when he said, sure, you'll win. And Ahab says, see, I told you, you never has anything nice to say about me. So just to be on the safe side, Ahab dressed up like an ordinary soldier. And he let Jehoshaphat be out there in his royal robe. So if anybody's going to shoot arrows at the king and kill the king, they'll kill him, not, not Ahab. But remember somebody shot a bow at a venture? I used to wonder whether that was a venture store or what kind of venture it was. But it means just Santa shot an arrow at random, and it just happened to hit Ahab between the joints of his armor. And he took him back into Samaria, and he died, and the dogs came and licked the blood up by the pool of Samaria. So uh, Micaiah's short-term prophecy came to pass. And the same thing happened under Jeremiah, one of the prophets... Claimed to be a prophet of the Lord, said, you guys are going to stay in captivity for two years, and you'll be back. And Jeremiah says, that isn't the way I heard it. I heard it's going to be 70 years. You better build your house there and make your home there. And uh, I'll tell you what, uh, if what you say is true, and you're st uh, if you're still alive in one year and all your family's still alive, uh, you'll know the Lord hasn't spoken by me in a year's time that fellow was dead. So short-term prophecies as well as miracles confirmed the man, and then you better listen to what he says. So the Word of God is our authority. But also our relationship is our authority. Uh, he gives us the exousia, the authority, to become the sons of God. And that uh, puts us in a special place with God. Um, we responded to the invitation of Jesus. We received him. And to all those who received him, God gives us a special, intimate relationship, this inside track, this entree, as Paul puts it in Ephesians, into God's special presence. And... Um, so the people, Peter in 1 Peter 2.9 can call us a royal priesthood. All of us are priests. We all have a special inside track with God. And that is, I think, our authority. And when you um, come with the conflicts in Mormon teachings and in Mormon books and in Mormon history, what you're really doing is undermining their authority. You're showing the prophecies fail. Some people like to use prophecies. Some people like to use Joseph Smith's lies. Uh, remember, he, uh, um, if you read the Nauvoo Neighbor for the day of the week right before they destroyed the Nauvoo Expositor, where they had the whole council minutes of the town spread on the front page of the Nauvoo Neighbor, um, the Expositor had already printed the statement that Joseph Smith had this revelation on polygamy, on plural marriage, and in that paper, both Hiram and Joseph deny that there was any such revelation that had to do with anything at the present time. It had something to do with the past and it had nothing to do with the present. And that's just plain lie. Some people like to use that. Who wants to believe a prophet who will lie? Others like to uh, show his revelations were changed. Uh, others like to show the theology was changed, like Malene Layton. Layton has been very, very fine in showing the Adam-God uh, uh, conflict with the present Mormon theology. So all of these things are a way of kind of... Um, uh, undercutting the authority. Now, the object is not to destroy the Mormon's faith. 
The problem is his faith is resting on a wrong foundation. So you want to destroy the foundation so you can lift his faith up and put it over on a solid foundation. And uh, in doing that, remember to give him a solid foundation. Remember to give him the gospel message. Now I better stop here and give you a little time for uh, some questions because we've got to end in about 10 minutes here. Now, you don't have to limit your questions to what we talked about. You can ask anything on uh, anything that uh, you've read of mine that you wanted to know about. Yes. Wes, uh, I had a couple of observations, not to detract from what right. is a, a very fine uh, presentation, but just some nitpicking. All right. Uh, number one, on the confirmation of the uh, uh, Septuagint by the Qumran community uh, scriptures. Mm -hmm. uh, on the particular passage in Deuteronomy, the Deuteronomic book, whether it's Mosaic or from the Deuteronomic reform, you know, mm -hmm. is not a book on angels. However, the Qumran people and, the, and during that time angelology was just blossoming all over the place. Mm -hmm. So I think it's maybe a typical instance where the Masoretic text might be the older one and it supports the Septuagint because of a chronological sequence there. And I think this sort of thing happens a lot. We need to get all those texts together and look at them very carefully. But something more to the point than that was on uh, the completeness or the reliability of the New Testament text. And I'm struck by the fact that the first canonization was done by Marcion, and the first that we really have any. And Marcion was the guy that took all the plain and precious parts out and wrote a super Pauline, you know, gospel, right. which mm -hmm. uh, praised the Lord the thing didn't survive and the apostolic material did come down. But at that early a date, which is immediately after the apostolic period, if there was that type of massive tampering with the text going on, you know, that I'm led to at least want to go back and look more carefully at that period. Mm -hmm. And especially even in the apostolic age or immediately afterward, uh, comparing like the, the gospel according to Mark and Matthew and finding not so much plain and precious parts taken out, but an, a, a growth, uh, things added in. Matthew is larger than Mark. And when mm -hmm. you try to see why it is, then you begin to see a pattern forming. Yeah. And while I'm not trying to uh, defend the uh, typical Mormon position, you know, I, I think that we gloss over too quickly in saying, okay, we have a, a canon here that goes back to the apostles and we're clean on it. You know, I, I think there's, we still need to look at that early period very critically and very closely. I don't think it's going to change our uh, Christianity, per se, mm -hmm. the basis of it. You know, but, but there are still yeah. things to be found. Yeah, well, let me respond to that, if I may. Uh, concerning the uh, Septuagint text, the... Uh, the text in Qumran was not a Greek text, it was a Hebrew text, and um, uh, so you have really two traditions. You have the Qumran tradition in Hebrew text, and you have the Septuagint tradition in Egypt, uh, both uh, testifying to the presence of that phrase. And so I wouldn't be as, as um, uh, perhaps uh, unsettled about it as, as you would uh, from that vantage point. Um, concerning the matter of canon, we didn't really get into that, which is what you brought up, what books belong in the, in the Bible. Uh, it's true that Martian uh, was the first one to publish uh, a, ca a canonical list, and the church's publication of canonical lists of books, of books that belong in the New Testament and Old Testament, was a response to Martian. And when they were responding, they were not responding by making up a list. They were responding because Martian had eliminated what the church already had accepted but never had written down. Thirdly, in regard to Matthew, Mark, as a relationship to each other, uh, the reason that most scholars have the priority of Mark as over against uh, Matthew and Luke, which raises the necessity of postulating a second source beyond those two for the counting of the similarities of incidents in, in between Matthew and Mark and Luke, and with a German word is Kellen, so they would just call it Q for short, uh, is because in the 19th century, the Tübingen School in Germany especially had uh, labeled all Gospels as late, 200 AD. Then uh, one of the professors at Tubington got the idea that maybe Mark was early. And instead of the scholars of the day saying, well, let's, let's see whether the rest of them are early also, uh, they all jumped on the bandwagon and said, hey, we got one good authentic gospel. And so for 
a century, over a century, scholars have just, without examining the question, accepted the priority of Mark. Uh, Professor Farmer came along and re-examined the question a few years ago in his book, and he concluded there was absolutely no basis for uh, holding to the priority of Mark. Now, he did the irrational thing. He simply asserted the priority of Luke without really proving it either. And I remember reading a response to that by a Christian scholar in which he um, uh, pointed out that one day we might get back to the original position of the priority of Matthew, and then we don't have to worry about all this Q stuff and so on. So I don't know that the thing fell out exactly the way you have it in your mind. I think maybe this is a residual of uh, uh, the church in the 19th century feeling it had been given one authentic gospel when actually they were really still taking three away.